Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the ISL Schools Talk Show. My name is Arkan de Lomas, and I am a grade 12 student in ISL Qatar. This show is a collaboration between ISL London and ISL Qatar to provide a platform to share experiences and gain a deeper appreciation towards ISL's pillars, passion, diversity, understanding, and of course, identity. Our topic today is transitioning to virtual schools. And our wonderful guests are Mr. Richard Parker, ISL London's head of school, and Mr. David Monk, ISL Qatar's head of school. It's a pleasure to have you both here. Thank you. Thank you, Arkham. So first of all, my strategy with my questions is that I'm going to first start off with a strategical question for you. And that is, how did your schools plan for going virtual? I'm sure that required quite a lot of strategy. <laughs> yeah, I, I'll talk a little bit about what happened. We started planning to go virtual a few weeks before lockdown. And I think we're quite lucky because we just thought this is going to happen. So we better plan just in case. And when we started planning, it was a just in case scenario. So we want to be in a situation that if we go virtual, we're ready. And then the first thing we did is thought, OK, how are we going to look at the experience of going virtual? And the sensible thing to do seemed to be to look at schools that had, had that experience. And I'm very lucky because I used to be in Hong Kong and all the schools in Hong Kong had been, they had been uh, in lockdown since about January. They'd been, I can't remember what time it was, but they'd already been there five or six weeks. So what we did first of all is we just talked to all those schools and found out what had worked, what hadn't worked, what things that we should be thinking about, what we shouldn't. And from then we started drawing up some plans. And there were kind of three core themes that came out. The first was that you can't plan it as you would a normal school and you really need to look at what's manageable and what's not. The second thing that became really apparent was that well-being was going to be central and we had to have some we had to have some ideas in place for how we thought about well-being for the whole community. I think for London, one of the key things that came out of that was the role of the um, uh, mother tongue teachers but also ways that we would support teachers in terms of time. We knew that they would get burnt out if we didn't introduce certain things that allowed a certain amount of time. Um, and then the third thing was kind of technical simplicity that schools had tried to do too much and had to pull back. And what we needed was simple and effective and everybody going the same way. So those were kind of the three core starting points that we had yeah um very very similar in in many ways from uh our aspect um we had a, a very good idea probably about three weeks before the lockdown occurred in qatar that this situation was developing and it was very likely to happen um and we also made contact with schools in, in china um who were um, who had been through uh, the process and I think were, were well into five or six weeks at that stage of, of um, close down. Uh, and so using and sharing resources from a number of schools, we created um, an initial online learning plan um, that we sent out to parents and to, to staff uh, about two weeks before the lockdown actually occurred. Um, and sort feedback uh, and sort of made any uh, initial changes that, that we felt we needed to make to that plan. Um, we already had uh, a number of the tools in place. Google Classroom was being used from the upper primary and throughout the secondary manage back, obviously. Uh, and Seesaw was a, a central platform in the primary school. So we already had um, the tools, if you like, to build on. Uh, and the only things that we then needed to consider was um, the use of, of uh, video conferencing platform. And of course, we had to think about um, child safety issues uh, around the, the use of, of such platforms. And so then had to develop a, a policy for, for this, making sure that, um, that we 
uh, factored in those considerations into the use of video conferencing where you're in effect being invited into somebody's home uh, and often um, you know, the, the workspace for many kids is their bedroom uh, and so we, we really had to think through how uh, uh, that was going to impact our use. Um, and then, of course, we, we started uh, largely with the use of Zoom uh, as being our main platform through the primary school because that allowed a, a full class um, to be on screen at, at any one time. Uh, and then very quickly we had to change uh, the use of that as Zoom bombing became a, a, a thing. Um, and so we then had to move the entire platform to Teams. Um, so. You know, we, we knew when we first put our plans in place that it would have to be a continually developing um, program because none of us had ever been through this before. Um, and we knew that whatever plans we put in place, we would have to review um, as we we did we, through surveying the parents. We then adapted the secondary school schedule that we were using um, and uh, really made the whole um, the whole use of online learning more sustainable. Yeah, um, for myself, with um, with I remember when the whole thing started happening, and we started, and teachers started reminding us, uh, telling us that uh, there was going to be this big change. We might end up having virtual schools. I remember one of my peers telling me that this might only last two weeks, <laughs> and look how that turned out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you mentioned something. Both of you mentioned something about. Um, other countries and and learning stuff from other countries. I'd like to hear more about that. How are our schools and international schools around the globe helping each other as we learn uh, this in this new way of living? Well, let's take one example that actually David brought up, which was the safeguarding. It's we realized from talking to Hong Kong schools how many safeguarding issues there were going to be because we could talk to different schools and they could just say this happened and this happened and you've got to watch out for this and. So we were able to draw up a, a pretty uh, a, a pretty good safeguarding policy before we started. Um, and I do think one of the really nice things about being in the international world is there is a kind of uh, that it's small enough that there's still a network. So most people who've been in international in the international education for a period of time have people in different countries they can contact and in a in a global crisis like this there's nothing more useful because you're not just reliant on a national uh a national response to a situation you can go outside you can talk to people you can have different ideas you can think of different ways of approaching a problem and i do think for us i mean we know that when we went into it we were i mean everyone could see we were prepared and there were lots of schools in the UK which weren't prepared at all um, and just kind of had to try and work out ways to deal with the situation. And I don't think we would have been that well prepared. Well, I know we wouldn't have been that well prepared if we hadn't been able to talk to other schools around the world and and look at the ways that they had to come to terms with some of those problems. Because as David says, you're suddenly in a, you're trying to run a school in a completely different way and you have to do that really quickly. Yeah, and I mean, I, I would say this has been uh, one of the big pluses actually that's come out of um, this situation is perhaps a level of collaboration uh, amongst the international schools that uh, ha has been huge. Um, and a lot of that ha has been, um, I guess, brought about as well because of the different stages of uh, the pandemic hitting different parts of the world. And as Richard referred to earlier, um, China obviously was was one of the first um, areas that, that really was impacted and schools uh, were closed down very soon. Uh, and then it almost spread. And I think probably uh, the UK was was one of the later countries to, to actually close down. So as schools have gone through that experience, they've shared that experience with those who are about to go into it, as it were. Um, there have been a, a, a number of platforms as well that I think have been really um, uh, very significant in bringing the, that collaboration together. I, I, Richard, I don't know if you're making use of the AISH um, platform, the Association of International School Heads. 
um, being one of them. And uh, they really have brought a, a huge number of resources together. Um, there's also the Association of Advancement of International Education. And so they, they've been very significant platforms in collating resources from different schools and making them available um, to other schools to, to use freely. Um, uh, and you know that collaborative aspect has always been something that, that for me has been a wonderful part of being in international education often it involves traveling to, to conferences and things like that where people share their ideas and things that they're using in their schools that are successful uh, and now it's moved on to the virtual platform it's, it's made it a, a lot easier to access yeah the only thing i'd add to that is that um one of the results of this, I've always also been speaking to lots of British heads that I've never spoken to before. So I've been to uh, as a couple of online, I suppose you call them mini conferences, where suddenly I'm uh, having conversations with 30 British heads. And people never did that before um, yeah. and didn't realise how easy it was. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I I would also add to that, I mean, it's not necessarily directly through the international schools, but there's also, also been a, an explosion of access to um, to educational thinking. Um, you know, a huge number of webinars. In fact, I've got two um, this afternoon um, where we're looking at uh, the, the area of well-being. And, you know, if we're in this situation and it's ongoing, um, what are the implications of that for student well-being? Um, and so there are a, there's a proliferation um, of webinars and uh, opportunities uh, to share ideas through uh, through virtual learning as well. Sounds like you found a lot of uh, new advancements or uh, um, technological assets that you could use. And that's great to hear uh, for, for both staff and students and even parents. But I'm Speaking of staff, students and parents, um, I'm sure a lot of people um, are curious if you've done any surveys and if there's any feedback you'd like to share from that, that, uh, that you got from the survey that you might have given, whether it's to staff, parents or, or students. Um, yes, we, we did survey the, the parents initially um, after four or five weeks uh, of online learning. Um, it was important that we had feedback on, um, from them about their experience uh, of our online learning platform um, and it was uh, we had a, a large number of, of parents who were involved uh, and we had yeah lots of positive feedback but also um, it was very very clear that um, we were trying to do too much um, and we were expecting the the students to also try and do too much in in really difficult um, circumstances and it was almost as though we were um, overcompensating uh, I think for um, the new environment that we we're working within and that led to a, a change particularly in the secondary school we'd already um, I think that the, the schedule that we'd arrived at in the primary school was was as it needed to be um, but in the secondary school we ensured that we had longer breaks um, between hour-long sessions so if you like shorter um, and more intense without a doubt uh, periods of learning then a break allowing people to get up move away from their computer um, and actually have some downtime before coming back again to the screen uh, so it, it really was very very important feedback for us we since then we we've, we've uh, sought feedback in different ways we've we've had um, particularly within the primary school uh, a number of uh, virtual parent meetings um, where the parents have been uh, invited to come along and again discuss and share their experiences and also learn from each other um, which has been very very useful yeah um similar we surveyed we actually sent out a weekly survey to parents to students as well they've had a whole series of surveys we had a well-being survey to staff that went out um uh, a week and a half ago um and we've we've also had some of those um online we, well we've had some online ptas which have they've still carried on but in an online format and we've got some um, parent conference and probably the changes are very similar in the sense that the, the thing that comes up is time 
we knew it would come up. Um, and probably the single biggest change we made was that we introduced um, a Wednesday's elective programme in, in primary where there were just electives all day, so basically to give everybody a break. Um, that's probably the single biggest change that came from as a result of that feedback. Yeah, I, I should also mention that we um, surveyed the students through the homeroom uh, teachers as well um, to get their input into the changes that we made. Um, we also introduced uh, um, within the primary school uh, our midweek uh, reflection um, day. So that allowed students to consolidate, if you like, on their learning um, and to spend time with their teachers actually going back over things that uh, that they'd been working on. That's great to hear. Are there, um, and it's also very important as well, I understand um, that especially during this time, because of all the political things that are happening and also the, the health issues that are occurring, a lot of people are also very trapped in their rooms or in their houses. And that can be very stressful for a lot of people. And they and it's it's I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will be pleased that you're actually letting giving them an opportunity to express themselves as as frequently as possible so that they can let out steam um, as much as possible, even despite the barriers of you know distance <laughs> yeah, yeah but are there any sort of um are there any sort of uh, struggles that uh, you had with strategy and also with um uh, making these changes or any of the struggles that you haven't mentioned so far that you'd like to mention um perhaps i i would start here and say um from the perspective of making the shift Remarkably few. Um, I would say the the staff have been absolutely amazing um, across both schools. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, I don't think anybody would have been able to have predict that a, a change of this size and nature could have happened so quickly and so smoothly. Uh, and I think it, it's a credit to to all of the teachers and all of the support staff as well. Um, the amount of flexibility that they've brought to what they do uh, on a day in day day out basis, and, and that rethinking um, of how to still achieve the goals of the school, but through a completely different platform. You know, difficult areas. Obviously, the the younger the children get. Um, the more support they require inevitably from their parents, for example, to access the online learning programs. And um, I think that's been a challenge for us to, to ensure that we remain flexible to help each child on an individual level, not just the, the early childhood, but throughout the school, because each child has a different context and a different level, um, if you like, of support network available to them. Um, and we were fortunate that, that most of our children um, do have good access to um, uh, computers, to laptops and so on, which isn't the case um, throughout the world. Uh, but that's been harder for those families with younger kids and particularly um, if both parents are still working. Um, you know, and we, we do still, have, we have a number of many families where both parents are having to go out to work every day. Um, and so that's that's been a, a difficult challenge to try and meet their needs. Yeah, I agree with lots of that. I think, uh, I mean, the staff at London have been absolutely amazing um, in the way they've adapted. And now there's a huge sense of pride across the whole school about our virtual program. I mean, it's, and it's, it's shared by the parents and they can see and they've been really impressed with the staff. I mean, I do think uh, they've just been amazing. Um, and in ways that that you wouldn't expect. I mean, I can give I give two examples. I mean, I hate to give examples because they're specific, but they just they illustrate what lots of people are doing. But one of them is um, a, a mother tongue Arabic teacher. At the end of Eid, she went round to every single family and dropped off a present for them. I mean, no one had asked her to do that. But it was just an amazing, and it just, and the Arabic parents were like, wow. And I, no, you know, she just did it. Um, 
another example is forest school. I mean, we have forest school. You probably couldn't have forest school in Qatar. It would be really <laughs> difficult. <laughs> I'm not... <laughs> we might have a desert school, not a, not a forest yeah. school. Mangrove school. It's <laughs> hard. Yeah, it's quite... Actually, it's hard even in, uh, in London because we've got a park. But um, anyway, forest school is something that you would think, that's really hard to keep going. But um, we've kept it going. <laughs> And the creativity that's come about in how to keep students engaged in forest school, going out, collecting things, making things, doing things. Um, that as well. And the one, actually there's a third example I, I really should give, which is the way the community reacted and the whole school reacted, um, which was our canteen. Now, one thing we, we didn't do as a school and we're really proud we didn't do is we didn't, nobody was furloughed and nobody was made redundant. We tried to find a way that absolutely everybody had uh, purpose in this situation. And one of the ones, one of the big things we did is that um, our school canteen staff, that's a, that's a tricky one because there's no food, right? I mean, there's no student. But what they're doing now is they are, they're producing food for the local homeless centre and they produce on the days they cook they could use 130 meals so there's all that and that's also helped give pride to the community now all these things have come about it's an amazing amount of creativity that people have shown and ways of adapting that have just been uh, have been really really impressive so there was a problem question wasn't there um yeah. <laughs> yeah younger is more difficult no question the younger you are the harder it is um and the and the more I would say demands on teachers as well to come up with creative ways to deliver a really good program the younger you get which I think again our staff have done as effectively as anyone could do and there's one last thing in terms of problem I still find it I try and speak to as many people as I can but the fact that you're never together as a community and you're always trying to gauge things when you see so few people except few is I find that hard. I always feel like everybody's in a little bit of a void. My next question was actually going to be, are there any uh, highlights or any things that, um, any ways that this virtual change has allowed you to use the virtual environment as an asset to learning? Is there, but I'm, I'm, you've answered in a lot of ways. Is there anything you'd like to add on to that? Any ways that you've used the virtual environment as an asset to learning possibly better than um, in face-to-face? -face I think blended learning now will be a, a fact, not a, an, a, a work in progress. I think blended learning in schools has become a, a permanent feature now. I doubt schools will ever completely go back to a situation where learning is not blended. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I mean, other high spots, the uh, um, bright spots that I see coming out of this that I think will really benefit uh, schools as uh, students go um, back to face to face is I think um, a real um, renewal, if you like, uh, of the understanding of the importance of that social contact and that face to face uh, component of, of teaching. Um, and I think many teachers have really um, perhaps reevaluated their role as a teacher um, because it really is at the heart of everything that we do. We're, we're not teachers of a subject. Um, we're teachers of children uh, and young adults. And I, I think that that will be a far stronger component of learning um, as a result of this. Uh, I think um, development of independence in learning uh, amongst our students is, is something that inevitably will come from this. You know, one, perhaps one of the, the challenges that we had, particularly with those younger kids, um, is to encourage parents not to provide the solutions. Um, if they're there and they're acting as the support to their children, often the first um, almost reflex action is to help the, the kids solve the problem. 
um, or even you know uh, teach them themselves. And and I've had so many conversations where I've said, no, that's not what we want you to do. We want you um, to try absolutely give them the guidance to help them find the solutions. And even if that's directing them back to their teachers and empowering them to go back to their teachers and ask more questions, um, then that's been something that really ha has come through, um, I think, very, very strongly. You know, I've had a huge number of parents, particularly from those younger kids that we talked about, who have now seen their kids um, working at a level of independence that they wouldn't have imagined at the start of this. You know, these six-year-old um, kids grabbing their computer, getting themselves set up for, for their meeting with a teacher or, or so on. Um, can I also say, uh, from a, an assessment um, perspective, uh, the cancelling of the IB diploma exams, and I know not everybody um, might agree with this, but for me, that's a huge highlight. Um, <laughs> Because if that helps the IB realize and recognize that there are other more authentic ways of assessing their students than a one-off final exam, then that could be another huge bonus that comes out of this. And already the IB are talking about um, the possibility of looking to continue with this model for the future. So a number of real pluses that have come out of this. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I think the IB, there was a time that the IB would be more adventurous than it's become in recent years. And uh, there are a lot of heads around the world who would like it to uh, adapt more to the, the reality of the, the times we live in. And this has forced them to rethink. We've had two major highlights in the last few weeks that are the kind of high points of the IB programme. One is the PYP exhibition and the other is the personal project. Now, when we went into lockdown, I don't think anyone could quite imagine how they were going to happen, but they were both fantastic. The level of creativity that students and teachers showed in the process was phenomenal. And we've got this huge website now for the personal project where you can see all of them and their they're all grouped in a way that's that's really accessible and looks great and that's examples of just the whole way that everybody so quickly adapted to to um new demands that's really an eye opener and not only the schools but industries are changing they're getting to look back on 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 how they work do they need to have um, their workers staying nine to five every day or, you know, nearly every day. Are, are all these things necessary? Can more be turned into virtual to allow more efficiency, effectivity, and also to benefit the workers? And so, with, and these changes that many industries are considering making uh, seem to be possibly permanent. So relating to that, will this period of virtual learning change how ISL looks to deliver learning next year and beyond i honestly think it's too early to say <laughs> yeah that's a fair point <laughs> yeah i mean richard mentioned though obviously blended learning model you know we uh, were making plans of course as all schools that are not yet reopening um to be able to deliver uh, a model of learning that does look um very different in that it has to incorporate um, both virtual and face-to-face -face, um, learning. Uh, we know that we will have some students that will not be able to return to school. Perhaps there are um, underlying health issues for the child or for uh, family members um, that would make that return to school um, too, too risky. Similarly, amongst our staff, um, where we might have more vulnerable members of staff. Um, so, also, to be honest, the, the requirements of social distancing or physical distancing um, will mean that when we do reopen, we will have to have fewer students on campus at any um, single point. So we have to be able to offer something that looks very, very different. Um, and as Richard mentioned, I'm sure that will um, impact education in the future. Um, I, I mentioned earlier assessment as being one of the highlights and specifically the IB diploma exams. But if we think even beyond that, 
um, the idea of assessment in a virtual environment has to look very different. Um, and we have to reconsider um, the value of somebody sitting at a table with no access to resources in order to be able to answer some questions that we've thrown at them relying on memory. That's not how life works in the real world. So we've had to accept more authentic models of assessment. Um, and I hope that that continues throughout the world of education, and I'm sure it will um, in both ISL schools. And I do know that both ISL schools have been looking, have actually been looking at different models of assessment, which no, which one day we'd all like to be in a position to adopt. There are people in the world who are looking at seeing assessment in terms of ways that you can demonstrate mastery rather than doing some strange antiquated uh, memory old. test. <laughs> yeah. Looking back on everything we've talked about, what has been, could, if you could pick one or I guess we can allow a few more than one, but uh, I'd like to know what are some of the biggest takeaways I know it's still early and things are still changing and, uh, you know, summer's coming up and things might be very different when September comes. But are there any big takeaways that you have taken that you have um, uh, learned to uh, taken in due to this pandemic? For me, rather than learning something new, it's it's actually been a confirmation of, of many things that um, I already valued um, and wanted to see more consideration uh, paid towards in the world of education. Um, and I think it's forced um, that reconsideration in many ways, you know, and we've touched on uh, a number of those things already, the importance of social and emotional well-being uh, amongst our students. Um, it's at the center of everything that we do. And if that is not right, then effective learning cannot happen. So that has to be our starting point. In, in fact, our, our discussions for reopening um, were initially looking at the logistics behind what we were doing. And we had to refocus and we came back to the question, what is it that we've been missing through virtual learning? So we have to make sure that when we open or reopen face to face, we're not just putting the virtual learning back into the classroom. If we're saying that what we've been missing and, and um, missing out on, if you like, it is that social contact, then we have to make sure that there's room for that. Uh, the, I think another big takeaway is, is for me is that things can happen quickly if there's the right um, push for it. You know, uh, I think we achieved a level of change in two or three weeks that would normally have taken a year or two years. I'd agree with everything that David said about um, social distancing and the difference between physical and social distancing, because one thing we've all learned from this is the the social importance of schools, that um, it's, it's the one of the big things that, that, that's, that you lose when everything goes virtual. Um, the com whole community aspect and I also agree the other big thing is change and I think I think the big thing that it's probably made me reflect on is the nature of change and uh, the thing about change is it's often perceived as hard um, but actually change isn't hard I mean it really it's the thing about change is it's contextual so if you choose to get married, for example, you don't go, oh, God, I can't do that. It's a massive change, but you just go through the change. And really, it's made me reflect on the, the, the context that lead to real change and, and how and why they happen. For people that I've interviewed or talked to casually, peers, and including my little brother, who is in grade eight now attending NYP, one big thing that everybody's been talking about was, uh, like both of you mentioned, it's the the social, the the physical distancing. Because even though we try to keep talking to each other online, it's it's it feels different. It's almost like an uncanny valley. And so that's something that that I've seen a lot of my peers miss. And it's even 
I've, uh, many of us find it as a threat to their mental health, um, uh, possibly causing depression in some, at least luckily with my friends, we've been able to contact enough to, as far as I know, prevent it. But so that's, that's something that my peers and I have missed a lot. I'd like to know, is there anything that both of you miss about uh, the usual school environment? um that uh, that you'd like to mention something uh, maybe something uh, that we haven't mentioned or something that you find really important seeing no we've, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> we've mentioned it that face-to-face -face contact um i miss that so much uh i uh the big probably the biggest aspect for me is of course the student contact that i have on a, a daily basis and i can main, make sure that i maintain that that's so much harder for me in my position now because so much of my contact now is with the with the teachers and with the parents um you know and i really miss that that contact with the students thank you very much that's all for this the first episode of isl schools talk show it's been a pleasure getting to know more about isl's transitioning to virtual schools with mr richard parker and mr david monk thank you so very much Thank you. Thank you, Arkan. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard. Good to see yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, David.